send an email through Joe Hubbard to me and he will forward it if there's really an issue there. But we'd love to have you. Absolutely. Well, um, we're going to go over to your main presentation now, Andy, if you want to get that up and, and, and ready, if you need to do anything well, with that. Um, while Andy's sorting himself out, I'll just a reminder that we're doing our 4,000 subscriber giveaway today. You could be receiving uh, this Stop Following Me t-shirt, we're not related, as well as this DVD, brand new for the creation research, One Deadly Bite, filmed with David Reeves, who I know that uh, Andy has done stuff with David in the past as well. All you need to do is just say hi in the chat, say hello, let us know that you're there and Sam is keeping a record and we will do the old draw from a hat a little later in the program and let people know who has won the giveaway. Um, but Andy, you're here. I think the presentation's all ready. So I'm just going to go over to you to... Uh, discuss do your presentation regarding the bombardier beetle yeah and how many hours have i got oh uh, no three or four you've got plenty of time <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you guys in australia are just waking up so you're fine oh, yeah. us guys over here are going to sleep so <laughs> yes. i'm not going to put you i'm not going to go like that long i might you stick to just two hours we'll see oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway here we go so uh, it's great to be with you all, and let me just say briefly, I've worked in all sorts of areas. Um, I've worked in the Royal Aircraft Establishment on aviation and aerodynamics. I love to teach on that. I did old-fashioned wind tunnel testing in my day. That's all been changed now with computer, computer uh, fluid dynamics. And uh, I also, as, as I've just been indicating, I've actually been working on the bombardier beetle in the latter part of my research at leeds university so we're going to talk about this beetle and um i'm attached to the university of leeds and what i'm talking about is actually biomimetics what's biomimetics you say well it's all to do with learning from nature so um you actually may have heard of things like the lotus leaf the gecko foot the burdock plant, which gave the idea of Velcro, the Wright Flyer, when the first people, the Wilbur and Orville Wright flew in 1903, they were basically copying the birds. That's an example of biomimetics. And there are all sorts of other examples, which I'll be referring to from my Bombardier Beetle work. So learning design from the created world is what I'm really talking about here. And that's what biomimetics means. Just to give you a little bit of an idea as to the, the sort of atmosphere I sometimes get way back, um, Professor Richard Dawkins said this. I need to go backwards. He wrote, this is 2006, that's a long time ago, but Stuart Burgess and myself have both worked uh, in academia and we've spoken quite openly about our Christian faith. And uh, this is what Richard Dawkins said once. Maybe Burgess and Macintosh are right, and all the rest of us biologists, geologists, archaeologists, historians, chemists, physicists, cosmologists, and yes, thermodynamicists, that's me, and respectable theologians, that's not me. The vast majority of Nobel Prize winners, fellows of the Royal Society and of the National Academies of the world are wrong. Not just slightly wrong, but catastrophically, appallingly, devastatingly wrong. And, and then he said, it is possible. If Burgess and Macintosh are right, though, he says, the scientific establishment has fallen. And I thought that was a wonderful quote from uh, The Guardian, I think it was, no less. I, I don't generally take The Guardian for obvious reasons because they never gave me a right of reply to that letter. And, uh, you know, I wrote to the editor and they got no reply either. So I don't generally subscribe to that paper for, for those reasons. But that's what we're up against in the world. But frankly, I don't mind. I don't expect Dawkins to ever agree with me because, of course, he's got no... Uh, friendship with Christ. He stands against any belief in any God. And of course, he doesn't know the truth. But when people know the Lord Jesus Christ, I do expect them to agree with me. And it saddens me greatly when 
people who are believers stand against the creation position. With that in mind, there is a book called Wonders of Creation, which Stuart Burgess and myself have written. You can get this on Amazon. Um, in fact, you can get it quite pretty good price on Amazon. Uh, day one, you'd probably have to, which is the publisher, that'd be a little bit over probably about 22, 23 pounds, might even be the full 25, but you can get it for, from Amazon at about 20, I believe. So there is actually a chapter on the Bombardier Beetle. Let me just say that if you're doing anything to do with design, is this a God of the gaps idea? My speaking on design, does that mean that I don't understand some things that I just say, well, God did it? Actually, no, it's the opposite. It's because of what we do understand and what we do know, this points to design. So Romans 1.20 is a very valid verse. The invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Another verse for you, Colossians 1 says, for by him were all things created. Um, things that things that are in heaven that are in earth visible invisible thrones dominions principalities powers all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things and by him all things consist hebrews 11 verse 3 says the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear the reason i put this right up front is that i want you to see that I expect things to be designed because of Romans 1 verse 20. And our job as Christians who believe in creation and who are scientists is to actually unfold what God has already made and to show that it has indeed wonderful design features. So do you see that this is not us grappling in the dark and saying, oh, we don't understand how this works. It must be that God did it. It's the, totally the opposite. If you like, I was ahead of the game. Not that I was particularly doing it for my glory. Please don't think so. But I was looking at this beetle and thinking, this is amazing. This beetle does extraordinary things. It must be designed. And I must be able to find out what's going on. So I was asking the right questions. Do you see? So when you have this creation position, when it comes to the bombardier beetle or whatever it is you're thinking of, I'm asking the question, how does it work? Here's a picture of the beetle spraying a tiny little spray at a finger. So it shows you that it can be very small. Some are a little bit bigger than that, not much bigger. Where is this found? Well, mainly in hot countries, but they are found here in England as well. We're going to look about the valve system. We're going to look at the chemical system. I'm not sure we'll get through all of this. Don't worry, you can go to sleep and have an ice cream and just forget me if you wish. But you'll you'll see that actually I'm going to go fairly fast through some of this. I just want to keep your interest that there are quite a few things that actually we've gone through. We've got experimental prototypes, we've got a fuel injection system application, pharmaceutical one, a fragrancer application. Some of these we haven't followed on. Uh, we've actually moved on from fire extinguishers now to fire sprinklers. Not all of these have worked, but some of them have. Here's the African bombardier beetle. And where is it is found? Well, it's found mainly in Asia, North America, South America, and of course, Africa, as I've shown you there. The African beetle is a bit bigger than the others, about two centimeters. The others are about one and a half centimeters, maybe even down to one for European. I have seen some um, in the south of England. Apparently, they do exist because it's a bit warmer down there and they're always close to water. And they feed on bits of meat. Some reckon that they may even be cannibals, although I think they do feed on dead creatures. I don't think they're generally feeding off live creatures, which they uh, attacked. It's usually bits of meat that they find. I've even had some of them in my kitchen within, under a 
in a plastic box with a glass top and had them scurrying around. Um, most interesting creatures. How does it work then, the bombardier beetle? Well, it ejects a mixture. I'll put all this slide up. It ejects a mixture of chemically heated steam and noxious chemicals out of its back end. It is not passing air after a big meal, though I hasten to add. So it's not doing what, uh, I won't use the word that some people would use, but uh, it's not doing that, okay? So it's not, you're not healing them, you know, when somebody's just eaten too much. The, it It's actually a, amazingly a separate system to the digestive system. And using this system of blasting, I'll show you a video of it soon, it wards off predators such as ants, birds, spiders, and frogs. It's, uh, um, it's generally uh, wins and it usually stuns its opponent it doesn't usually kill the opponent but it's got a movable exhaust turret which can even move and come over its backside and go forwards like i showed in the picture earlier of it shooting at a finger so it's a bit like having a tank turret where the tank turret can even move right over its head and go and you know come from the back and move over forwards or in any direction it wishes so it's much more versatile than the t whatever tanks we've sent recently no the germans sent them recently to ukraine well they're much better than, than those <laughs> because the turret can go in any direction it wishes now let me show you some video clips of this beetle so let's hope that the sound works uh, Joe and Sam, let's see whether this works. Ah, I'm not hearing anything. Ah, oh dear, don't say it's not working. Oh dear. Whoops. Let me try again. Can you hear that? Yep. Yep. That's what you actually hear in the laboratory. That was in the laboratory of Tom Eisner in Cornell University in New York State some years ago. Okay. Now I'm going to play you another video. This time it's from our friends in the BBC who have who and this is from the film Alien Empire, quite some years ago. Few creatures will risk annoying a bombardier beetle. It mixes a cocktail of deadly chemicals in a special chamber. They react and explode at boiling point from its rear end. That's some quite an awesome fun, isn't it? Chemical Watching weapon. that. Now, now we're going to play from the same film. Um, we're going to play a little, uh, a bit, bit of a different clip this time. Um, this one is uh, from a different film called Secret Weapons. And it shows you Professor Tom Eisner. Sadly, he's died now, but uh, he was the most interesting gentleman, sort of old school biologist, loved to do experimental work. And he's written a book uh, called For the Love of Insects. And it's a delightful book. Just watch these two clips. One of the really amazing things about this animal is its ability to spray in a very beautifully aimed fashion. And that shows up very nicely when you put the animal on indicator paper. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pinch very lightly one leg after the other, just as if I were an ant biting these legs. I'm going to start with the right hind leg, right front leg, left front leg at 400 frames per second the action has been slowed down but not enough to see the individual pulses so they went to a lab and filmed the beetle at an even faster speed at an incredible 4,000 frames a second Oh, <laughs> there were
were the pulses, each one corresponding to the individual bursts of sound. So what these clips are showing, um, guys, is that um, Professor Eisner suspected, because you could hear a, a note ee, from the beetle uh, and a pure note, he knew that that must be representing each note, like a note on the piano represents a frequency. So E would be somewhere around 440 cycles per second. That's A on the piano. Or if it was a bit lower, it might represent only 250 cycles per second for C on the piano. So all the notes on the piano have pure frequencies. So he knew that if he was hearing such a pure note, there must be a vibration of something around that frequency that you could actually hear. And indeed, he found that because when you slowed down the film, you could see the individual pulses, as it was called, on the film. So we were then began to look at the scanning electron micrographs from a sacrifice beetle in uh, Tom Eisner's laboratory. Let me tell you a fun fact that actually Tom Eisner began to know all each of these beetles in as individuals. You know, he'd say, oh, that's Fred, that's Jane, that's Peter. And uh, so, of course, when he cut one up, he had to sacrifice one. But, uh, you know, he was, he was quite a character, was Tom Eisner. And he could tell that there was an inlet valve, okay, which is the one that I'm pointing to there in the picture. You can't see it very clearly, but there is actually an inlet system there. You're looking at the ex exterior of a combustion chamber, and the combustion is going on inside, and there's a blast coming out from the exhaust system, which is the uh, more pinky uh, arrow there that you can see. And I said, is that the inside of the tube that you cut? He said, no, that's the outside of the tube. And I suddenly realized there was a membrane, which was that's pointing to, which lifts under pressure. That was a light bulb moment for me. So what you've actually got looking end on is when it's when the membranes collapsed and the valve is closed, this is just the outlet valve. Then you've got the red part, the membrane, just sitting down there. But when um, the membrane is open under pressure, then it obviously allows the blast to come out. And that's what's going on. So there is quite a number of uh, parts to the cycle here. And we'll just go through three of them. You probably can't read that slide too well, but it's actually saying that there are two chemicals coming in, hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide. And then you've got a catalytic reaction on the side of the combustion chamber, which involves, as we say in uh, body chemistry, when you're dealing with biological systems, you don't call them catalysts, you call them enzymes. And these enzymes are very important. They're either catalase or peroxidase or both, which are involved with the bombardier beetle. These cause the chemical reactions between hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide to go much more quickly, even though those catalysts, those enzymes don't take part in the reaction. So the catalysts, we believe, are on the walls of the combustion chamber. That then causes uh, an explosion to take place, which stops more stuff coming in and opens, as I said to you, the exhaust valve, which I mentioned earlier. So you've got fuel inlet valves and exhaust outlet valves. And let me say this, that the size of the combustion chamber is only about one millimetre. You're dealing with a tiny, tiny combustion chamber. And the finding of a sophisticated pressure relief valve was a very important moment in this project. It really showed to us that we were on the right track, that we'd actually managed 
um, to see that there was these uh, re, the, these chemicals were under pressure. They wanted to come out, mainly water and steam. And it was, I suddenly realized it's a bit like a pressure cooker that is enabling these chemicals, mainly water and, uh, and vapor, to come out under pressure. So one of the things that it's like is the V1. This was during the war, and it was powered by gasoline, petrol, and air exploding. And when it ran out of fuel, then the bomb, which was in the, the nose of this horrible aircraft, um, uh, that bomb went off, of course, when it hit the ground. Many people died in the 1940s as Hitler sent these horrible beasts over the channel uh, to England. Many people in the vicinity of London died. But the, the system was powered by an explosion, repeated explosion, pushing a jet out of the back, which pushed the, uh, the flying bomb forward. Now, the beetle obviously is not uh, using this for propulsion, although it does brace itself as it um, makes the blast out of its backside. But it does show you that this idea of pulse combustion is something which um, uh, has been known for decades and used even by the Germans during the Second World War. They didn't know anything about bombardier beetles that came a little bit later. In fact, it was a Nazi during the Second World War called Schildknecht who understood the chemistry of the Bombardier Beetle. He was certainly a Nazi sympathizer. And Tom Eisner, a real sort of twist here, Tom Eisner was no friend, of course, to Nazi sympathizers, because you could probably guess from his name that Tom Eisner was actually a Jew. He's died now, but he, his father had to flee the Nazis. So there's an interesting side story to all this bombardier beetle. So anyway, back to the main point. You've got combustion par excellence, an explosion, but not just one explosion, repeated explosion. It's like having a machine gun coming out of your backside and being able to move it in any direction you wish. and to be able to shoot this machine gun at about 400 to 500 times per second. That is pretty impressive. I think you will agree. Now, just a word on the chemistry of what's going on. Uh, by the way, there'll be a test, and I'll ask Diane Eaker and John Mackay to mark it, and even Craig Hawkins. Now, I'm just pulling your leg. It's, uh, but, uh, um, I'll tell you this, that there was a certain gentleman that I'm going to refer to in a moment who does need to do some tests in chemistry. I'm coming to that. Anyway, here's the chemistry of the Bombardier Beetle written out. Now, I'm not expecting you to follow all this in detail, but some of you might. The chemistry is a hydroquinone, which is the C6H602, and the hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. It's got an extra oxygen to water. So the hydrogen peroxide wants to give off oxygen. Not, it doesn't, it will do it fairly easily, but the hydroquinone doesn't easily um, give off its hydrogen. But once it does, that then becomes benzoquinone and the released hydrogen combines with the released oxygen and it produces water. So you've got two chemicals, hydroquinone, hydrogen peroxide, and the enzymes, the catalysts that I mentioned are catalase and peroxidase. So this is catalytic combustion carefully timed. Now you've all been taught that you don't play with fire. You don't play with fireworks when you're young. Um, and if you're going to evolve this bombardier beetle chemistry, you'll imagine a lot of um, failed experiments with bombardier beetles blown up because they didn't quite get it right. 
But these bombardier beetles get do get it right, and they've got a special system to contain this explosion in the explosion chamber and just to open the valve, the exhaust valve that I mentioned, to get the blast coming out. I told you that there was a certain man from Oxford, you can guess his name, who I reckon needs to do catalysis 101 because he didn't understand one of the key issues of the bombardier beetle, which is, as I mentioned, that the hydroquinone is very important and needs to release its hydrogen. And getting into a bit of detail here, some of you, maybe a third of you will understand this if I use the term endothermic. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, that means you've got to put heat in to get the reaction to work. Exothermic means that heat is given out. The hydrogen peroxide is an exothermic reaction. It gives off heat. So if you have a nice bottle of hydrogen peroxide and you happen to spill it on your smartphone, it will burn up your phone very quickly, particularly if it's pure hydrogen peroxide. It's a very dangerous chemical. Anyway, here's Professor Richard Dawkins in a younger incarnation of him uh, lecturing to uh, young people in Faraday's lecture hall, no less, at the Royal Institution at Christmas, claiming that he understands the chemistry when he doesn't. Let's hear him. 1991. Uh, in fact, the hydroquinone does nothing at all. We can put that on one side. The true story is that hydrogen peroxide on its own uh, does decompose to form uh, oxygen and water, but it needs a, a catalyst under normal conditions to, to do that. Um, this black powder here is a catalyst. It's not the catalyst that the bombardier beetle uses. The bombardier beetle does use a catalyst, and it does, in fact, squirt uh, this hot substance into the face of its enemy. But if you put a catalyst into a weak solution of hydrogen peroxide, then you're going to get a little bit of bubbling and it's a little bit warm. That might have some effect on the predator. That might slightly de deter a predator. And uh, it would be um, not particularly dangerous to the beetle. Now we've got a smooth gradient, a bit more concentration of hydrogen peroxide. And that's distinctly warm. That would work more effectively against a predator. And by moving gradually up the slope, gradually increasing the concentration of hydrogen peroxide, we can end up with So there is a smooth slope all the way up to the effective deterrent against... Well, was he right? Pressure. No, he was wrong. Because he made his fatal mistake by saying the hydroquinone has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with it. And he needs to go back and do catalysis 101 or chemistry 101. Um, there is an important reaction of the hydroquinone. This is my friend Garth Hewitt some years ago at um, Liberty University, where I'm an adjunct professor, and he's a chemist, and he's showing how vital the hydroquinone is and what happens when you put that with a cat catalyst. And a little bit of heat is effectively has to go in, but you get a lot of heat out eventually i'll explain that in a moment watch this drop it straight down the center yep that was a platinum catalyst platinum catalyst Now it's your quinones form. See that's orange? Yes, that's the orange. Thank you for showing me this, Garth. This is excellent. Yeah, that, that orange there would be your benzoquinone. The bottom of orange you color. Now that's what Richard Dawkins should have done, was done some experiments 
where you've got both the hydrogen peroxide and the hydroquinone and this is what is in fact going on i'm just going i'm don't i don't apologize for this because this is an important point actually there's many more reactions than what i'm putting up here but i'm breaking up the overall reaction into three there is a endothermic reaction which is the hydroquinone which is the top one okay then there is the hydrogen peroxide which is the second one which is exothermic and richard dawkins was right on that it is it gives off heat ah but the reaction which he effectively missed was the third reaction which is a product of the fact that you've released hydrogen where well, you've had to put heat in to get it going right but you've definitely released hydrogen and the hydrogen then combines with the oxygen and bang it makes a huge uh big blast roughly or nearly 300 joules per mole as against the 100 joules per mole of hydrogen peroxide on its own and that means that overall you get about 200 odd joules per mole from from the overall chemistry now that's that's okay that's a detail you might say but it just shows to you that you shouldn't just believe everything that a somebody says when they tell you oh you can get this system gradually no you can't you need to know what you're doing if you play with fire you'll burn yourself and you'd have had a lot of problems with beetles blowing themselves to bits or else getting eaten by predators so how does it work it's not simply hydrogen peroxide it's hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone and there is something we don't yet fully understand whoops that we don't yet understand how these chemicals are produced we know they're produced in the same tube and it's a very very thin tube and these reactants don't do anything to each other without a catalyst it's only when those two reactants come into the combustion chamber that things things happen very, very fast so those are combustion chambers there are two combustion chambers and they are shaped a bit like a boxing glove and you'll see there that at the top there is a pinching of the boxing glove under pressure which stops more hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone coming in and then as I mentioned earlier you can't see it on this picture but there is an exhaust system where a membrane is lifted under pressure Christine Ortiz from Massachusetts Institute of Technology has shown that in a blast both carburetors I might call them or both combustion chambers are going on at the same time causing their reactants to be pushed out as hot products mainly steam and hot water so here you can see it let me just show you this again you can see that both combustion chambers are ejecting their mixture at the same time so what did we copy well actually we didn't copy the chemistry having spent some time telling about the chemistry we didn't copy that we just copied the valve system and this was the early computer modeling that we did where we took an eighth of the volume of the chamber assuming that it was a cylinder when of course it isn't but it just gives you some idea as to what's going on when you take the volume to be the same and the the actual dimensions were very very small indeed um the actual dimensions of the chamber were about 0.6 of a millimeter so not quite a full millimeter width or diameter and then if I show you this you can see the other dimensions the we had a tube through which the the um the mainly 
steam and hot water is going to emerge. So we're doing a computer simulation. We're not dealing with the chemistry. We're saying that we've got water which wants to boil but can't until a membrane right next to the small tube at the bottom here, this tube. So you're just seeing part of this tube, but it goes round there and it's 0.05 of a millimeter radius. So it's 0.1 of a millimeter. That's very, very small diameter. And this is about 0.3 of a millimeter. So the total um, diameter of the actual chamber is about 0.6 of a millimeter. So this is small. You're not dealing with large things at all. We're going to say that we've got the hot water it wants to boil. Um, it's under pressure. We're going to assume that it's 0.1 of a bar. That means 0.1 of an atmospheric pressure above atmospheric, which is quite a high pressure for a small object like this. And the vapor pressure for boiling would then be a little bit higher than 100 degrees Kelvin above zero. Um, so it's it, above zero centigrade, which is uh, 273 uh, degrees Kelvin. So it's about 105 degrees centigrade, wants to boil. So it's in a uh, heated condition. It can't boil until you release this valve. So we're going to release that membrane at time t equals zero. We're going to make some assumptions about laminar flow. For those of you who know about such things, I won't go into detail for those who don't. Just assume that you've got something very, very small that we can make some critical assumptions about the flow, which don't, which means we can simplify the computer, the computer modeling. That's basically what that means. We're going to see an ejection going to the right, and you're going to see a clock in the top right hand corner, which is measuring how many milliseconds we're going to be using. In fact, we're only going to get to something like two to three milliseconds and everything will have taken place. What is a millisecond? It's a thousandth of a second, right? So if we get to three milliseconds, we've got all, all the water and the steam, no chemistry here, just got hot water and steam. If we get all that out in, a th in three milliseconds, if you do your sums, you'll realize that that is about 300 uh, plus per second. If we get it out in two milliseconds, that's about 500 times per second. We wanted to see whether heating the water and having it under pressure would get everything out as quickly as possible. And we found that it did. Watch the clock at the top right, point four of a millisecond, point six of a millisecond, almost at one millisecond. It looks like it's going from right to left, but actually it's the way the color's done. It's actually moving from left to right. Oh, we're nearly at two milliseconds now. We've got most of the water and steam out. And by the time we get to about three milliseconds, certainly you've got very little left. So that was a very important finding which we did in the computer modeling. So a very rich businessman then met us, heard me speaking on the computational fluid dynamics and said, will you be build a rig? Well, I never built a rig in my life. So I had to get people who knew what they were doing. And we built a rig. Uh, I say we, I didn't do it, as I say, but I just watched other brilliant technicians build this rig. And it was made of perspex because we weren't quite sure what was going to happen with an electrical heater in the middle. Were we going to sort of blow this perspex combustion chamber? Well, it's not a combustion chamber. It's just a heating chamber. Were we going to blow it to bits? Well, we've got a heating coil in there and we monitored the pressure. We got an inlet valve coming up from the bottom. There's an exhaust valve going to the left of the... Uh, of the chamber there. And we've got a return valve here in case something goes wrong. The chamber is about 20 times the one millimeter chamber of the beetle. So it's about two centimeters long. And this is the initial result we got from our experiment. And 
You can see here that there is a laser going across the blast of water droplets. And that is a Malvern laser, which is measuring the droplet sizes. So that's what we were doing there. And you could see that we got a very sophisticated receptacle here to collect the water and the steam. I am being sarcastic. That is anything but ingenious. It's just simply a bin, a black bin, such as you put outside and give to the bin men on Fridays. And um, we injected water and steam into that bin. Well, things got a bit more sophisticated as we moved on with the work we were actually getting some very high um, frequencies we got up to about 100 200 cycles per second and you can see here a much better prototype working in the top right hand corner and yet another one there and this was used for fuel injection this was exceedingly useful because this showed that we could add um, fuel droplets which have been made into droplets not by an atomizer but by heating the fuel and then releasing it under pressure breaks it into small droplets which industry were very interested in so that was one application which we were particularly um, pleased about because that patent that we took out for a fuel injector, although it wasn't used for a fuel injector as such, it was used for an additive to add to diesel engines to try and reduce the nasties um, by adding what's called add blue into diesel engines by having this system you could eject very small droplets of add blue into the existing combustion chamber of a diesel engine and that would then absorb a lot of the nasties the sulfur dioxide the nitric oxides and stuff which uh, are not good pollutants to put out of the back end of a diesel engine like a truck and so on that's been used uh, in europe in sweden so what have we learned? Precise catalytic chemistry going on with the Bombardier Beetle, precisely timed inlet valve and exhaust valve, controlled vapor explosion. I haven't talked to you about the sensory mechanism for this little tube to be sprayed in any direction it wishes. The movable turret I have talked about. The production of hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone is a problem that's not yet been resolved. I'm hoping that eventually um, someone who knows about these things um, will be able to resolve it. Um, we haven't yet resolved that. It does explosions at about four to five hundred times per second. You can keep a blast going for about two or three seconds. Then, it, you know, it's doing, you know, doing that repeatedly for two or three seconds gets a bit exhausted but then it will stop and then it will do it again for about 10 times so that's why it usually wins against a predator like a wolf spider which often loses a leg in the process of an encounter with a bombardier beetle and it's an example of oscillating combustion pulsing combustion we call that classic example of biomimetics the core technology copied is the combustion chamber design and the nozzle. There are applications to fuel injectors, as I mentioned, also pharmaceuticals. They would like to use it for nebulizers, for aqueous and organic um, examples of pharmaceutical nebulizers, aerosols and air fresheners, fire suppression, and also fire sprinkler systems. So there is quite a lot of possible applications. For a fuel injection system, you need to have very fine droplets. So you use a wide angle from the nozzle. That's one of the things that we can change. We have an active system where we are heating, whereas the Bombardier Beetle um, 
does not control its exhaust valve. It's a passive system. Once it gets to a particularly high pressure, then it op opens the exhaust valve. Whereas in our system, we um, we actively control when the uh, when that pressure relief valve of the exhaust valve is released. We also control how long the inlet valve stays uh, open. So there's quite a lot of features here which have come out from more recent work. Let me just show you one last clip, and this is David Attenborough on the range of bombardier beetles. And he's showing that you can get a throw distance of at least 20 centimeters from a one millimeter combustion chamber. Let's have a look at this video. But the master of chemical warfare is the bombardier beetle. It can create a chemical reaction within its body so violent that boiling caustic liquid explodes out of its abdomen. By pulsing the jet 500 times a second, it keeps its rear end just cool enough to prevent it being caught. That last bit isn't quite true because it's not the frequency which stops it rear end being because it's got very important material properties very low thermal conductivity materials in by where the spray comes out but it is true that um you can change the droplet size and by changing the aperture of the little tube coming out in our system you can get very different results whether you've got a large throw with large droplets or a small throw with very small droplets um sometimes you could get even a fairly large throw even with small droplets so the throw ratio is about 200 you can actually get two meters throw from a chamber which is just 20 centimeters so sorry you could get four meters from a, uh, across the room from a chamber which is about 20 centimeters so if you work that out the uh sorry two i said 20 centimeters uh, a, a throw of four meters from a chamber of two centimeters long get it right well that of course represents um, 400 centimeters from a chamber of two centimeters so it's a throw ratio of about 200. so that's an important finding so what's the summary here well we've understood the physics of the chamber and the valve system in the bombardier beetle it's an example of repetitive pulse combustion we've got the modality we've got the droplet sizes the pressure relief exit, exit valve, the inlet valve, the timing of it. This work was all sponsored by Swedish Biomimetics 3000. The applications weren't so obvious for the needless injector, although there could be applications for that. But they were fairly evidently of interest for the pharmaceutical industry. And also, there are other things that I should just point out here. For each of these applications, there are typical droplet sizes. For the pharmaceutical application, where you did in a nebulizer where you want your lungs to be helped to breathe again, you're dealing with sizes of about one to 10 microns. Well, 10 microns is quite small, um, but it's not the smallest. Fire extinguishers, maybe 100 microns, that's bigger. 10 to 50 microns for a fuel injector and 10 to 20 microns for an aerosol. So 1 to 10 microns actually is the smallest one that we did get. Well, we got a prize for the in 2010 for 
the award for outstanding contribution to innovation and technology. This was in the Times Higher Educational Supplement. Let me just briefly talk about the application to fire extinguishers and fire sprinkler systems. We had some difficulties due to size and power needed for the fire extinguisher. I had some students work on a scaled up model where you've got a lot of water in a not just a two centimeter chamber, but maybe in something 10 times that size, 20 centimeters. And I was hoping that this would work. But of course, the power needed is proportional to, or the power needed is proportional to the volume that you're trying to heat. Yet the heaters that we were using, the amount of heat that they gave out was proportional to the square, the surface area. So you're on a hiding to nothing as you get bigger you haven't got the power to heat. So we event, we, we had to admit that we didn't quite get that right. And although we had a good go, the students had a good go, I could see it wasn't going to work. So we've now come to the idea of a fire sprinkler system. This could be an applied system in naval vessels where you've got limited space, you can't afford a fire on a submarine at sea or even on a ship, a destroyer, you don't want to have a fire in that vessel, certainly space vehicles, you don't want a fire. So what we imagine is a sensor, it's very easy to have an infrared sensor to guide this sprinkler system to point in the right direction. And supposing you felt some heat in the corner of the room, you know that there is a danger of fire. So you then have my system, which squirts a mixture of steam and water and by the time the steam gets there and all the little fine droplets you've really just basically got cold water being fired in a very precise way to where there is the danger of a fire emerging you don't need a huge amount of water for these small fire sprinklers so i think actually i'm it's of course it's all in your favor as you get smaller because as you get smaller you go down in the amount of power that you need to the cube of something of, of one over a distance effectively so you're actually you you've got you, it's becoming in your favor and you've got more than enough power needed because that's going like the square so it's you the amount of power you needed is getting smaller at a much faster rate than the amount of power that you can actually generate so this should work we haven't yet got a working system but i'm looking at doing that so we are through with this talk and there is more on the website bombardierbeetle.org and there's a list of the patents that we've been uh developing and they've been of course to guard other people from copying our ideas so we've had great backing from a, this swedish firm and there's more, as I say, on the bombardierbeetle.org website. Questions from you? Well, thank you very much for that, Andy. Um, you might want to stop sharing your screen so that everybody can see you as well as everybody else. But other than that, there we go. Lovely. Um, thank you very much for that. That was that was absolutely fantastic. And I always enjoy listening to the uh, to the bombardier.